Ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, and other, welcome to the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival online. Uh, my guest today is chef, tastemaker, uh, former golf prodigy, all round glamour model, one time Uniqlo model. Am I, is that right? Uh, I think I'm that's based on a correctly. true story, Pat. Uh, David Chang, <laughs> David Chang, welcome to the internet. I am uh, honored to be here. I would much rather be in Melbourne for the Food and, Food and Wine Festival uh, in person than, than uh, doing it by Zoom. I think all of us are tired of Zoom calls. Um, but uh, yeah, it's weird. Everything's weird. We're, um, I mean, we're here to talk about your new book, Eat a Peach, but let's, let's scrap that. Let's talk about your tips for performing well in Zoom calls. What have you found, Dave? What <clears throat> works for you? Well. You know, uh, first is have a reliable internet. That's, that's, that's important. That's pretty important. So uh, I've been plagued with bad internet. And uh, secondly, if you're thinking that you have a very important meeting, you should wear pants. Uh, Just to make it seem point. like you're really like in a meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, I, I'm, I'm actually not wearing pants. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing shorts. I'm wearing shorts. I, uh, I ironed the front of this shirt, but not the back, and I haven't shaved the back of my head. So read into that as you will. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very frank and uh, free-ranging conversation. We're in a safe space here. Um, well, why don't we get to it? I, I've interviewed you a few times over the course of the, I guess, 10 or... I was trying to put a date on it. I think the first time I went to a Momofuku restaurant was in 2007. First time I went to New York, I got off a plane and I had my first ever meal in New York at uh, Momofuku Samba. Still one of my favorite meals of all time. I walked in, didn't have a booking, sat down, ordered, I'm going to say half the menu for one. And then the kitchen staff were so amused by that, that they sent me the rest of the menu, which I also <laughs> So that was, that was a, I feel like we got off on a good start there, but in the, in, in the time since I interviewed you last, which I think is probably a couple of years ago, you've become an interviewer in your own right. You have your own, um, you know, you're on TV with Ugly Delicious, but you also have your podcast. In the time that you've spent on that side of the microphone, what have you learned about how this works? The media side. Yeah. It's not easy. Ask the question side. How does it, how does it? Yeah, well, I, you know, what I've learned is, um, and I think this is actually something that I'm trying to apply on the culinary side too, is more often than not, I don't have really anything meaningful to add to anything. So I should just shut up and ask better questions and be a better listener. <laughs> That's what I've learned is uh, being an interviewer, asking pressing questions and knowing when to add value is incredibly difficult. Um, so yeah, this is all new. It's, it's, it's something that uh, I'm just trying to like get my 10,000 10, hours in. It's taken me like 20 years to get to that point. So it shows that you are clearly a quick study. Just learning okay. to shut the fuck up and let the talent talk is pretty much most of the job. But you know, here I am talking, hey. Um, if you were prepping to interview David Chang, the chef and sometime Uniqlo model about his new memoir, Eat a Peach, how would you approach it? Um, I'd probably like not approach it. I, I'd be like this guy. <laughs> like, I don't want to, someone else take this, 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 this job, this task. Um, I don't know. I, I'd be like, I, I'd, I'd ask the, the, the trivial questions because in something like this, like how are you supposed to ask anything? Um, you know, is it exactly the book that you wanted to write, Dave? That's probably what I'd ask. Well, Dave, is this exactly the book that you wanted to write? Well, Pat, it's funny you should ask that because <laughs> I think in my mind, and maybe this is shared by other people, when I thought about ever writing your like life story, it's only, you think it's going to be like defending your life, you know, with Al Brooks and Meryl Streep in a little bit that like you're sort of going to be able to have 360 degree access of every event and it's a stream of consciousness. That's what basically it's going to be. And it only makes sense in your head. Mm -hmm. No one else. 
Mm. And then when you try to write it or have someone like Gabe Lula write it and it's not exactly how you thought it was, well, you need to understand that when you put thoughts in your head onto paper, it's a lot like hearing your voice for the first time, right? At least from a memoir's perspective, right? It's like, wait, it is a version of a perspective of yourself that happened in the past. And as much as you want it to be the, 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 the final version of the truth, you can only get so close to it, right? And it's still just, it's not objective. It's still gonna be subjective. And I think that's hard. I think it's really interesting um, reading, you know, you've, you've, you've existed in the media landscape for a long time. A lot of what you do has been very closely documented for a long time by yourself, you know, by Lucky Peach in your, in the Momofuku cookbook, by other people. It's really interesting seeing some of the more familiar moments from the David Chang mythologizing, I guess, looked at maybe from a different angle or just from the distance of time, you know, and some of them, you know, they, they take on elements of pathos that maybe they didn't have. I mean, uh, I've got a bit, I mean, it just, just, because I really like inserting myself interviews in interviews as much as I possibly can, Dave. I <laughs> it jumped out at me. It's great journalistic practice. You should do it as much as you can as well. In one part of the book, you say back then, and this is when you were having a particularly tough mental health moment. Back then, articulating the most basic sentiment. I'm not even talking about feelings. I'm talking about stuff like ordering off a, a menu at a restaurant took immense effort. You can still find old video clips where interviewers ask me questions like, what's your desert island dish? And I visibly struggle to push the words out of my mouth. Watching footage of myself straining to talk about my favorite thing to do with leftovers, I'm genuinely surprised they didn't stop the camera and ask, are you okay? And I mean, that's, that's a familiar moment to me in, in uh, interviewing you and you think, I just thought he was like really busy or he was too fancy to do the work or too important, or he was like thinking about New York stuff and, you know, like, but instead that moment was a product of something you were going through. I mean, very, very interesting. Oh God, this is turning another journalistic one one having a, a question mark at the end of your statement is really useful. This is just me rambling now. I love you, Pat. Um, this is great. It just, for me, I just thought it was very revealing and I guess, well, Pat, no, 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 let me interject. I, all those things can be true as well, right? Like, I was stressed. I was worried about a lot of things. But it's also like, that's the thing. The more I think about anything anymore, the only thing that's true is that it's happened and that multiple perspectives can be seen. And our job isn't to, to be definitive that one is better than the other. I think our jobs, as we become more mature, humane adults, is to accept that we need to try our best to see as many perspectives as possible at any given situation. And that takes an ungodly amount of time and mental energy, but it's something that we should all strive to do because we may never know exactly what someone's gonna go through. You know, it's like, you know, I know you're a big fan of David Foster Wallace, like he sort of, sort of wrote the book on that. You never really know. And, and one person may see something and come to a conclusion and another person may see two different angles and realize, oh, that's not actually how I see it. You know, and, and, and I don't know what I said made any sense, but you know, we've talked, we've been friends, we've known each other a long time. And I could have been all of those things you just suggested. I could have been a pompous ass. I could have been a neurotic fucking mess. I could have been stressed out about personal life. I could have been worried about things happening in New York City. And I could have been completely discombobulated because there was a severe chemical imbalance in my brain. All of those things can be true. I think, I mean, on, on that multiple perspectives thing, there's a particularly powerful chapter um, midway through the book, again, where you're talking about a very challenging time in your life and you have the way you laid it down originally and then you've gone down and actually put a line through it and you've offered two different perspectives. There's sort of old Dave and new Dave on the same page. Um, and I think that really works. I think that really conveys, I guess, 
the benefit of the work you've been doing, I guess I, I want to say, but bringing this back to big picture about the book, what have you, what, what have you learned writing it? A lot has changed. You know, we started this project. I originally didn't, again, didn't want this to be a memoir. I, again, like this is very revealing and telling that I can convince myself of anything. And even though I had signed a document that says it's a memoir, I told myself this is a business strategy book or something along those lines. That can be a very powerful out tool and also something that can be incredibly destructive. Um, and both sides of those things are true for me. And in this process, as I took it a little bit more seriously, uh, and honestly, I think it all became a lot more in earnest after Bourdain passed, because I was, I was just like, do I have anything to say? And is it even remotely important? And what can I add that isn't narcissistic in a negative way? Um, and I thought, well, the best thing I can do then is just try to be as honest about all of my failures and shortcomings as I can and to be as transparent as possible, which I think I've always tried to be, um, um, whether people believe that or not. And, and what I learned is one thing is uh, everything really does revolve around your childhood and your parents. <laughs> and as much as I wanted to say that not me, well, it's fucking me <laughs> for sure. And two is um, you, I have a hard time thinking that just because I put in the work and I think comparatively speaking, I just talked to at least my friends and my peer group. Like I have put in a lot of work in, in, in my, my, my mental health and being a better boss and improving. And if anything, I think that's again, like something that I think I have been on honest about. I, I'm really good at fucking up. That's my skill set. And the only thing that I have is the stubbornness to continue and to try to not to make the same mistake twice. And if I have some gift or skill, it's, I just fucked up more than anybody else. Then I get, that's given me more data points. And, and that can be a fallacy as well in the sense that when I think about the book and the things that have changed over the three and a half years that we really worked on it, how many different perspectives unfolded. And I think, you know, we talked about perspectives a lot already. And, and that's what I really understand is how relative certain things are and how this sounds, this is going to seem like a non secretary, but I'm finding, I want to find a way for people to understand this. It's like, when I watched When Harry Met Sally for the first time when I was like nine years old with Meg Ryan and, and, and Billy Crystal, I laughed because my brothers and sisters who are older laughed. And then when I watched it when I was in college, I understood the college parts when they were in college. When they were 27, I understood it differently. When I watched it when they're 35 and now I'm 43, I'm way older than those characters. I understood it differently than I did when I was eight, 22, 27. And that's the interesting thing is you can continue to go back and yes, it is static. It will not change. You cannot go back in time and change those events, but you can revisit them as nostalgia and almost be a detective and see new angles that you didn't see before and unearth certain things. And for me, that's a lot. What happened was like, I prided myself too much that it prevented me from seeing new angles. And I, I, I you know, I, I, I tell myself I have a high degree of empathy. I can see different things that, you know, uh, I may not normally have seen in the past and now I can. And I think writing this book has made me realize like, I don't know shit. Number one, <laughs> number two, um, I have intentionally subconsciously chosen not to see things. And, and that's hard, right? Like one of the things that, for example, my, my father passed, and so much of my life has shaped my dad. And I, I, I have a tendency to flee from problems, right? And, and fleeing could be actually working, like doing work and being a workaholic, but also running away and reinventing yourself or whatever. And one of the things I had never wanted to be was my dad, ever, at all. Uh, because his ends justified the means. He, he, his only measurement for love was to provide for his family. Everything else was a, the ends justified the means. And I hated him for many years because of that. 
And then as I'm older now, I'm trying to understand like I didn't, and we talk about this in the book a little bit. It's a lot different now after he's passed. I, I never tried to see the world from his, his eyes. Coming to this country at the age of America with nothing, $20, sleeping in movie theaters, not speaking the language in 1963 and the racism and the abuse that he experienced, living through the Korean War, losing brothers and sisters to bombs and shit like that. Like, who the fuck knows how that must have been like? Living in North Korea, like, that's got to be brutal. It doesn't justify a lot of the misgivings that happen but I can understand. And with more than anything, it, it's, it's making me learn to forgive and to see different perspectives. And simultaneously, like I can, I understand why he was the way he was. It doesn't mean that I love it, but I can accept it now. And, you know, he was a hard driving dude. And what would in 2020 be seen as crazy abuse. Well, guess what? A lot of immigrant kids live through something like that. And it's never should be a competition. Well, my dad did it this way, or my mom did it this way. Everyone's pain and how they were raised is maximum to them. And for me, it was pretty bad. And I understand why. And we're all fallible. We're all imperfect. We're not robots. We're not born out of a platonic ideal of how to be something. And what I think about that and how he raised me and how Again, his entire duty was to provide and he worked hard and he did that. And he never said, I love you, ever. He never said anything emotive about his care. That's just not how he, how could he? That was another language to him. No one ever showed it to him. And then in some ways I've learned, I have been my father to some employees. And that's hard, that really hurts. And I, I, and, and I don't know why, for the life of me, I spent so much time trying to see who I am and to be better. And why did I get that realization now? That's, I, I'm mad at myself. I'm really mad at myself. Because I'm like, well, what does that say about me? And I go through this process of trying to understand that. But instead of recoiling from it, I am like facing it head on and being like, all right, Dave, why did you not look at it this way? And instead of maybe in the past being so self-flagellating, because pain is something that I find as a, a source of truth, because it never fails me, um, I need to learn to forgive myself. So I, I, I break the cycle. And I know what I just said sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo and therapy, but it's something that I really, I'm telling you exactly what I'm realizing. And that's you know from the book to where I am today. And when you when you tie like in like working in yeah, but when you th if you when you think about too like the culinary world like you've been you're a student of the game. It's like I go to a high school that produces I didn't know it at the time like a top you know, top high school like a for American conservatism white male conservatism. I didn't know that. No wonder I didn't fit in. But also it's like all boys it was pretty fucking bad. A lot of yelling, a lot of crazy shit. And then you go into kitchens. Not a surprise. Why did I, I never felt in anywhere in my life, except on sports teams when I got yelled at. And then I found a place where I fit in with a other bunch of other misfits in a place that is like pretty intense. All of those have a pattern of, hey, this is a lot like your home. And then I have to ask myself like, okay, that doesn't excuse me being a fucking jerk and yelling like a lunatic. But I have two options. I could be better or I can use it as an excuse. And, and that's what I'm asking myself. It's like, okay, I'm not going to rationalize it. I can see it. And the, the, the difference is, is am I getting better? And I, I will tell you, I think I have put a lot of work in to be better. And that's all I can say about that. So the conversation you're having with yourself now is a conversation you're having with yourself as a version of your father. Yeah. And how much I hate that. <laughs> Can I quote some uh, David Chang at you from a forthcoming memoir from Clarkson Potter, an imprint of Random House Penguin out now at all good bookstores, 32.95 Australian dollars. I just made that number up. 
Quote, Asian parents want their children to study unambiguous subjects like math. We would say maths here, Dave. Math and science. Although we say sport rather than sports. You say math and we say sport. Pardon me. Asian <laughs> parents want their children to study unambiguous subjects like maths. Sorry, let's take this from the top. <clears throat> Asian parents want their children to study unambiguous subjects like math and science, be good at golf and violin and avoid liberal arts like English or philosophy or political science or cooking. Anything subjective can be taken away from you. Yeah. And you don't have to be Asian to understand that. I think it's uh, anyone that immigrates to another country, they're leaving for better opportunities. And um, when I think about what my parents had to go through, my mother came from extreme wealth. My father came from nothing, um, but it didn't matter. They have, everything got taken from them. And to live with that mindset that no matter what you do, something's going to take something from you, unless it is very difficult to do. It makes sense why, you know, so many immigrants. And I know I spent, you know, I've basically spent like almost two years in Australia in, in 10 plus years. A lot of the immigrants in Australia, it's, it's, it's a, uh, work your ass off, make a lot of money, because that's an objective truth. Do well in sciences, do well in math, because that's an objective truth. No one can take an A or 100% on a term paper from you. And, you know, that's, that's a hard, hard love. That's really hard love to, to think about and all the other avenues that get sort of squashed in that process. And, I think the reality is, is, is I, 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 I understand that now because I didn't quite understand it before, but you want the best because you can only draw upon the experiences that you've lived under. And I hope that when my son is older and he has a path in front of him, I'm not going to say, you better get a A plus on this goddamn test or else. Right. I want, you know, it is, it is, it is again, my, my, agency to decide and and i want him to have the freedoms that we can have in this country and and to do what he wants to do doesn't mean that's going to be easy but that's that's the choice that i have to make and and i don't know what that's going to be but i think i'm learning what unconditional love is right and it's hard to realize that my concept of love and why i've had a hard time with relationships and why i poured myself into work but work is objective. I, if I go to work and I do all these things and I go to bed tired and then maybe drunk, I've earned that right to be drunk because I'm tired because I worked hard, repeat the day. Pay your bills, repeat the day. But like you sacrifice a lot along the way. And, and, and I, just, I just think that there's different ways to go about it now and, and I'm, I'm, I would tell you otherwise, like I would know what the answer is, but I don't. Like I, I'm, I'm just questioning everything. And, and Pat, if more than anything, I, I, when I say I don't know, like I really have very little confidence in anything because every time I think I know something, I realize like I didn't know shit at all. Like that was just a mirage. Have you read, um, it's a good, in 2020, I think everyone's reading Pema Chodron, possibly for the first or 10th time. Have you read When Things Fall Apart? I, uh, Chinue Chibe, yes. I, no, 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 this is uh, Pema Chodron, similar title. Uh, and this, she's a Tibetan Buddhist nun. Um, and the central drive of her, her, of this book anyway, is things come together, things fall apart. And that's what happens. Yeah. And that's it. It's just like you accept it. And, and I'm learning to accept things and, and, be grateful and have gratitude and appreciate what I have. And, and if anything, with all that's happened in the world, you know, th that's something that I think I need to have a, a, a big dose of. Um, how, how, I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of this book, a lot of uh, Eat a Peach out now, Clarkson Potter, a random house imprint um, is concerned with your mental health and, its relationship to your work. How have your colleagues been able to support you? 
when you're having a challenge mental health moment or a challenge mental health life? You know, the past six months, I, I, I was in a bad place. Not a surprise considering the world events and, and my father passing and a few of those revelations that I mentioned, like when you realize like, oh shit, I've been my dad. That's a, that's a hard thing to, to grasp. And it put me in a really bad place and, and um, I was spiraling out of control. So also with the fact that my entire life that I've dedicated to could go up and smoke, you know, there's no... That's not an abstraction. It's not an abstraction. It is, it is true. And, and you know, and if it, 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 I hate that our industry is so fragile and, 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 it's, and it shows how stupid it actually is too. And, and uh, you know, like that's hard. Like we all going to process trauma differently. And that's something I don't think anybody's talking about during this period is all the trauma the world is experiencing and how you're going to fucking process that. And for me, I still think I've delayed a lot of that. Uh, I miss my, my, my team. I miss working with people. I miss going to the restaurants. I miss the highs and the lows and you know, if everything else now, can you stay in business? And now all this other stuff and there's people that I've known that have died from this fucking disease. And I mean, this virus and, added with the fact that like just one of those things could be a trigger for depression and I was in a really bad place and the difference is is with a lot of work I've learned that strength isn't gutting it out being tough isn't showing that you can do it on individual effort I was able to get through this because of the love and, and kindness of the people around me. But I was able to, over the past few years, give people clues, you know, almost like Memento, the movie, like to remind myself and to others, like, hey, if I'm here, like I, I, I'm in a bad place. You know, it's almost like a safe word, but it's not a mm -hmm. word, it's, it's more of a feeling. And I was overwhelmed with gratitude knowing that in my darkest moments the past few months I had a, a, a community supporting me and that's what got me through it and that's the difference I think early on it was no one's with me everyone's against me I'm on my own and that might be true it might have been true but it doesn't continue to have to be true today what about um, what you as an employer as a leader as a friend, but maybe more in an employment context, what have you learned that you can do to support the mental health of people around you? I think it's to not judge. And, and again, everyone's pain is the maximum threshold for them. And You know, there, 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 there's a line in, uh, obviously the book, the cover is a reference to Sisyphus and Albert Camus' myth of Sisyphus and Camus were in the book, but there's a line where it's like, hey, you know, just be, the way you spoke to someone today, the way you greeted someone today was, you know, could have possibly have changed their, their future outlook. And I think that's what you have to remind yourself is at the end of the day, even if you don't want to, you have to be the best version of yourself to other people. And, and that means like, Hey, is everything okay? Is there anything I can do? You know? And, and, and I, when I said like a lot of this started with, with Tony passing, it's the same thing. It's, it's, I've been guilty of it. I'm sure other people have been as well is, is it's always uh, what's in service. What can the world and the community do in service to me? And I think that what I try to remind myself, more often than not, I fail because it's fucking hard, is how can I make sure that I'm in service to others? And the irony is all of my happy moments that are truly not ephemeral are when I did something genuinely good for other people. And that's the best feeling, fucking feeling. Yet for whatever reason, I continually forget that. And I get mad at myself. And that's, that's, the, that's the rub, right? So I think you got to remember just because someone's going through something great, right? doesn't mean that it's great. 
you know, that, that, that they, they may just be smiling on the outside. And it's not really something that's representative of what's going on in their lives. And it's hard. It's really hard. It's hard to, life is hard, man. And it's hard to always think of others. It's hard, man. And, and that's just human nature. But if you know people that have mental illness, just because everything seems rosy, doesn't mean that it's rosy. And I just, that's again, going to the perspective of things is, is uh, to truly be in another person's shoes. That's, that's, that's a whole nother ball game. And that's all you can do. And, and asking for help is a whole nother thing. And knowing that as long as people know there's a safety net. And again, like I'm not personally a proponent of all these suicide hotlines and mental health. I mean, they're an option, but for me and the people I spoke to, that's an embarrassment. You know, like if I call that, you know, it's an option. I'm not saying you shouldn't, just me. And I don't want to say it for anyone else. But for me, I, I, just, I just felt like there's got to be other ways, you know, not just this one way for you to get help. And I think sometimes it could be your friend or a, someone you barely know. And all of those things are true for me. Some people I reach out to or people that reach out to and help me are people that are like friends of friends or your therapist. It's like, it's, there's no magic bullet in all of this. And I think more than anything, if, you're, if you see someone going through struggle, you have to keep all options on the table. The one thing, the only thing that you cannot take off the table is hope. I, um, uh, on the strength of that, I mean, just thinking about the difference of outward perspectives on, on why things were going down, what, um, what I was going to ask what your, uh, I want to get some Australia, wedge some Australia questions in here. Yeah. We're all about Australia, but in that context, in the 10 years since, since you first visited Australia, you came here for the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, one of the great food festivals of the world. Um, yeah. um, it is. It really and you is. opened a, you know, opened a restaurant in Sydney in, in, was it 2012? That was, you know, has come to be recognized as one of the, the better restaurants in this country. In the time since, what, what about your understanding of why you chose to open a restaurant such a long way from home has changed? Like, what's your perspective on that? Because it comes across quite, you know, there's, it's, the, the context in the book is for those of us in Australia who just perceived it as, hey, Dave Chang's opening a restaurant in Australia, cool. But there was a bit more going on there for you by the sounds of things. It was escape. Yeah. It was escape. And escape me, to unreality. Well, a new reality because yeah. everything hurts so much. And this is a constant theme in my life, running away and, and, and running away from facing the things that I need to face. But sometimes you need to do that. You know, it's, it's again, you can't connect the dots till after the fact. And I, I mean, you know this, I'm sure we, I, 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 for a while I was like, I'm moving here forever. And get, guess what? Like, I love Australia. I really would. I really would. I, wa I really or wanted the, to, and I still the, would. Or the five square blocks of Australia that you, that you inhabited between the Star Casino, which, Dave, I have to say, your description of in the book is very memorable. To <laughs> a gangbang between airport Radisson's or something. It's, it's a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, people don't know how shitty that casino looked like. Um, before the refurb, if people don't like the refurb now, which I think looks great comparatively, like, anyway, it's like, I love the challenge of it all. We were tasked with the impossible task. And like, yeah, again, like that's, uh, by, by forcing myself and the people around me to do something that we're not supposed to do, it delays all the things that you should be worried about. I remember, I remember thinking at the time this casino has offered this guy anywhere. Like you could have had a glass box on the roof looking out over the, all the harbour and instead you chose this weird viaduct, like which at the time had a view directly onto the Adriano Zumbo patisserie. Yep. What was that about? I wanted it to be as difficult as humanly possible for us. And, and could again, like when I can think about what, that decision was, and, and, and now you can as well with hindsight in the book and all that you know, 
it's probably the most fucking insane decision I think anybody I know has made in a long time. It's so insane, dude. Like, it's so crazy to me. Because most people would, um, if they're going to do that, that's a cash grab. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make tons of money. And yeah, you can do that. We were offered that. And I said, no. Like, I was so idealistic in ways that is, like, crazy to me. I was like, fuck that. I want to I wanna, I wanna do something different. I want to do something new and I want to be ambitious. And I, we assembled a hell of a team and we chose the worst location in, in the coal casino. <laughs> and I, it wasn't even designed to be a restaurant. I was like, that's, that was, that, that was going to be like a jewelry store or something. I was like, that's what I want. I was like, you said I can have anything. I want that fucking space. Cause you know why that challenge is impossible. And I want, if we're going to do go halfway around the world, 21 hour plane flight from New York with literally no staff with the exception of Serpico for the first month with ingredients in a casino. No one gives a shit about casino restaurants. Everything, when you think about it, was a horrible idea. The deck was so loaded against us. We were, we were, you know, interlopers. It'd be one thing to do in a cool neighborhood like Surrey Hills or something like that. You know, but we chose to do something that when I think about it, it was like, holy fuck, that is insane. And when I really think about what we did with Greeno and Clayton and Chase and Sue and Charles Leong and Kylie Javier Ashton and Greta and that whole team is, is so close. Amazing what we were able to do. I actually think what happened there was so unbelievable that I, I still have a hard time thinking how to explain it to people that don't know Australia. Like I, I, that I'm really proud of because we did something that was damn near impossible and no one should have given a shit about it. But the problem is we care too much about it. And um, I'm more as proud as I was about all of that, that pales in comparison to the pride I have for what Kylie and Paul have done with Say Both Sense. And, and then again, like it has nothing to do with me. I have done nothing other than here's the keys, go for it. And I am so much happier and prouder about what they've done than the beautiful stuff and the hard work that everyone else did in those first few years of that restaurant. And, and you know, there, there, there were highlights to that. And uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to try to do something that impossible ever again, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure proud that we did it. What you, you said that there was in the book that there's quite a lot that you took away from your extra Australian experience that you've put into the other Momofuku restaurants. You said, particularly with uh, Sue Wong Rees's um, input, it was kind of the first time you thought about, this is crazy, just stick with me here, offering hospitality to the guests at your yeah. restaurants. Yeah, that was a real wake up call. Because, I mean, for people that ate there, like, we were not, a, like, we were okay. We we're good. We were not out of the gate what people thought we were going to be. And we really took some time as any restaurant should. And I think that's another thing that has to change is the pressure. And when people are talking about work-life balance. A lot of that has to do with media. We can't just fucking expect restaurants to be perfect right out of the gate. I know that the play is there, but this is a two way street and, and the pressure for us was how we seen it was life and death. We have to make it perfect, but unfortunately we failed. We had, we we're a team that never worked together. We were working with ingredients that even people in Australia weren't really working with and we were doing something new. And, and I don't say we sucked, but we weren't as good as later when Greeno and Clayton and Chase were sort of like found their groove. But in the interim, three to six, three to six months in, it dawned on me, the only reason why we were getting anything good reviews at all was our front of the house. And that's when I ate crow. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like. And, I'm, and here's the other thing. We, I've been blessed with front of the house, amazing front of the house, basically ever since I did Momofugu. It was the first time where I took the head, my head out of my own ass and was like, oh, this isn't a competition between back of the house, front of the house. You know what this should be? A team. And... You know, it, it, I, I really learned that, wow, having great hospitality can make the food better. 
So it was a beautiful thing and, and it was a humbling experience. And that moment really changed our, our future for Momofuku. It was like, you know what we always want to do? Be good at the things we suck at. I mean, I think what, for the first few years, most people would say Momofuku's got not great service. It's, a fic- it's effective service. Doesn't mean it's great. And one of the things I've always wanted to do and people that work in the industry know, it's like, you want to be better at all the things you suck at. And that was, that became one of our focuses. Like, oh, why is this working better? And really analyzing it and giving people the, the power to make decisions to make the service elements world-class. Quote, food, ac- food across the country has become porkier, spicier, brighter, better. That's sort of a pull out of your big picture view of, you know, the contribution of Momofuku over the last 20 years. If that's the legacy of your last 20 years, how do you want to leave the food world 20 years from now? I'm wrestling with that. And, and, and I think before we even ask the next 20 years, we need to really look at the foundation before we build 20 more years upon it. And I think it's, before we get ahead of ourselves, we still need to analyze the past so we don't repeat the same mistakes. And I think first and foremost, there's a, there's a, a dearth of equality across the board and representation across the board, both in the restaurants, in the labor force, in the media that covers it. And, um, you know, I think the future of restaurants, it will not be the voices that you've heard from in the past. And I hope that is the case. And I hope that the goal that we can figure out how to do it. And it's easier in Australia with a government that provides benefits than the dumbasses that we have here in America is um, a kind of environment where you don't have to live hand to mouth moving forward. That would be great. For everyone in every yeah. field, I suspect. Exactly. Um, I should probably let you go. I have two, two last questions for you. Uh, what do you want people to take away from the book? Actually, let's make that the last question because that's okay, the okay. question. I have to ask you, I'm duty bound. When are we going to see you in Melbourne again? I know that's a very big question in, in the middle of a global health pandemic. When, when I feel like it's safe to travel again. Um, do I want to? I, I miss travel so much. I've never cooked so much at home in my life. Um, I miss seeing Paul. I want to give him a big old hug. I miss, I miss Sydney. Uh, Fuck Sydney. I, I get. I know you. Listen, you're 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 a Melbourne boy now. Um, I miss dainty Sichuan fragrant fish eggplant. I want to eat some pho. I want. I mean, listen. I, I miss Golden Century. I miss everything, and I, I miss being able to travel. And it's something that I think I took for granted having that privilege and that that opportunity. And and I don't think people really understand how much time I've spent in Australia. Granted, most of it was in the Star Casino, but um, I, I I love Australia, and and without a doubt, it's it's a place that I talk about a lot with my wife, and who knows what could happen down the road, but. Australia is an amazing, amazing place. And I I love it. And like America, it's got the great and it's got the bad, but people don't understand just how great it is. So Melbourne, amazing place as well. And I know you know that even though your heart's still in Sydney, Pat, you can't, you can't tell me otherwise. Um, David Chang, what would you like the people who read Eat a Peach to take away with. And I'd like to say, if you're on a knife edge wondering whether you should buy the book, ladies and gentlemen, and other in the audience, you should absolutely buy it just for the, um, of course, for Dave's life story, which is important and engaging, but for the 33 uh, rules or 33 guidelines Dave offers to young and aspiring chefs in the back of the book, which is gold. Oh, I'm glad you like that. It was a a real toss up, is is this even sensible? for people so no, it's good that's the uh that's the massive pork shoulder at the end of the delicate degustation mm. there <laughs> um well i i don't know you know i i uh 
I'd be lying. You know, this is a weird thing. If people hate your memoir, in effort, in, in effect, they're saying I fucking hate you. So, um, I've read, you know, I've read some great memoirs by some people I don't particularly like, and I've read some terrible memoirs from people who I thought were awesome. So, I yeah, that that statement doesn't fly. But. <laughs> I, I I don't know. You know, I, when I think about it in buckets, it's this, and there's no priority to this. There's no descending order. I think first it's a, it's about being Asian and, and having that idea and knowing that I don't fit in maybe to Asian identity or American identity. And I'm just learning to be comfortable in my own skin. And, and, and I know as sure as shit that if I was in my early formative years and a book like this was out there, whether it was about a chef or not, I probably have read it just to be like, there's someone out there that might, I might be able to relate to. And I guess what I'd try to say to that is there currently aren't enough of those stories available. And I hope in the future, people would never want to read a book like this because of that. Right. And I think that's the goal we need to get to is, is, is right now there's still a shortage of that. And secondly would be obviously, I think the ability to talk about mental illness and in ways that are not prescriptive and ways that are for me and from my perspective and and uh, I wanted to be honest about it in ways that I think can maybe be shocking and it's not a depressing book per se but um, my goal for something like this and again like I don't want to say the goal of what I want for this book I think this is just a part of the process of where I would like things to be like in the same way I'd like people to accept MSG or the same way kimchi's become acceptable as a cuisine uh, or an item in, in gastronomy when it wasn't before was when people go to get help for mental illness or whatever neur neuroses they might have that they're not ashamed right and 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 the goal would be to have it on par as hey um I got Lyme disease. Hey, I have a, a, a tumor. Hey, I have this. Nobody wants those things to happen. But for whatever reason, we've accepted those as, hey, share it with, share with the world these, these problems. And right now, I don't think that's the case uh, for mental illness. And there's still a taboo and stigma. And I think all ignorance is based off the same ignorance. So that would be a nice thing to sort of see some movement is I'm not saying anything I'm saying in this book is definitive, um, but it's part of the conversation, I hope, and, and makes people talk about it both positively and negatively. And I think lastly, another big bucket would be the industry and, and, and frankly, how, um, how stupid it is, how beautiful it is, how, um, it's the best worst job you could ever have. It's the, all of these things. And, and I love it and I hate it and all of those things. And, 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 and maybe it's a time capsule, but also <clears throat> um, a reminder that if, if a, a kid like me could wind up here with a lot of lucky breaks and a lot of privileged fucking positions, then like it can't, it, it can be maybe a cautionary tale for a lot of people at the worst case. Right, you know, I'm always gonna think about worst case scenarios first. And if, if someone reasons me like, well, fucking, I don't wanna be that asshole. Like that guy's a fucking jerk. I'm like, well, that's a positive. At least you know what not to be. That would be my takeaway without even thinking about it ever before. David Chang, eat a peach, what not to do? I made a lot of mistakes, man. And I continue to make a lot of mistakes, but I've been incredibly fortunate and blessed to work with some of the best people in the business. And, uh, you know, I hope I haven't squandered any opportunities. Yeah.